and I was in a recent debate with a secular Satanist, Aaron Ra. He finally conceded to me there's no common ancestor for all proteins slash genes. Wait a minute, wait a minute. The, the Satanist conceded something? Yeah, the Satanist was defeated. I mean, I don't think he realized uh, evolutionary theory has just been defeated, and he's agreeing with me. He actually thought he was disagreeing. I'm the one who put it on the table. I said, there's no common ancestor <laughs> for all major protein families. And then he wrote back, maybe he was in a drunken stupor, but he's not going to take it back now. <laughs> he, he said, there's no flipping common ancestor for all proteins. Greetings to the brightest audience in the country. This is Real Science Radio. I'm Fred Williams. And I'm Doug McBurney, Bible student, science geek, amateur comedian. Fred, it is great to be back with you talking about real science on Friday. So that's right, Doug. We go out to our radio audience in Denver every Friday afternoon at 3 p.m. on KLTT. And of course, we've got the audio podcast, and now we are on YouTube. So you need to check out our YouTube channel. And uh, we've dug last week. We had a lot, a lot of fun the last couple of weeks, right? With the uh, homeschool oh, yeah. conference. Yeah, that's right. That's which you can also check out on YouTube. And the, and the thing about the YouTube is you can watch that anytime. You know, we go worldwide to a worldwide audience, Fred, unconstrained by the bounds of the traditional broadcast media. Our reach is now truly global. It is global. And Doug, yeah, our global our global audience is going to hear about how evolution is a dead theory. They've been hearing that for a long time from our radio show, but uh -huh. this time, you know, basically the tree of life is has been relegated to mulch, and we're going to find out why. <laughs> we're going to have a special okay. guest on that we've had before, and he's an expert in this area. He publishes yes. in major peer reviewed secular journals on this topic, so I can't wait to get to that. But Doug, you know, yeah. you mentioned global audience, and you know, while yeah. we are glo we are global, Doug, I'm not a globalist. Um, oh, I, you know, I think on our show we're strong advocates for a for a nation state, right? Amen. Yes. Yep. That's right. And, you know, so Luke he tells us in the book of Acts that even though God made of one blood all nations, meaning there really are no races outside of the human race, He also yeah. set boundaries of the nations, right? That's right. That's right. And you know, Fred, the first time I heard the term globalist, I, I didn't know what it meant. I thought, oh, okay, well, the world is round, and so I, I guess I'm a globalist of some sort, and and I'm I'm for free and ethical trade among nations and between nations. So I thought maybe I'm a globalist, but then then I found out that the globalist is actually a criminally insane satanic cult who wants to conquer the whole world for communists. And then I realized, no, no, I'm not one of those. No, not a globalist. <laughs> okay. Well, so Doug, we mentioned the, the uh, shows we had the last couple of weeks at, at the homeschool conference in Dallas. There was an art show going on at that time. So people really got to go back and watch that because we had some really great interactions with you know people at the art show. And then we compared them to people at the homeschool conference, asked them five, five of the same questions that really got to the heart of, you know, people's world views. Yeah. Well, I'd love to, you know, our special guest coming on, it would have been great to have put him up against some of these people we met at the art show. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I, I would put him up against, uh, well, anyone at the art show and almost anyone at the homeschool conference, although I will say some of those folks at the homeschool conference, they were a little bit intimidating intellectually, I, I must say. <laughs> uh, but, but our guest today... Can hold up, uh, could hold a conversation with any of those, uh, and can hold his own for bringing just interesting and uh, edifying information to the show. Fred, this week we have Sal Cordova. He is a molecular biophysics researcher. He recently published a paper on structural bioinformatics through Oxford University Press, which relates to today's topic, by the way. Uh, Sal also published a peer review reference chapter critical of evolutionary theory that uh, that appears on the bookshelves at secular universities right now. Uh, he's presently a PhD student in biomolecular engineering. He holds five science degrees that I'm not going to list them all here, but Johns Hopkins, other, 
other, uh, he's uh, undergrads in electrical engineering, mathematics, computer science. He was a senior engineer and scientist in the aerospace and defense industry working for MITRE uh, with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, their research and engineering department, and at Fort Belvoir Army Night Vision Labs. He's a graduate of Dulles Aviation Flight School, and he flies a plane legally. He's a licensed pilot. And before he did all that, he was into concert level classical piano. Huh. Wow. Hey, Sal, welcome to Real Science Radio. Thank you so much for having me back. Yeah, welcome back, Sal. Well, I didn't know you were a concert pianist. That's pretty cool. That's awesome. Well, I, I couldn't make any I couldn't make any money at it, so the Lord had other plans for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very few in that uh, business can make money, that's for sure. Uh, so, Sal, we're excited to have you on the show, and we're going to talk about your latest research, which has to do with protein orchards, and which kind of ties to, you know, Darwin had that tree of life that for many, for really for the last decade at least, even evolutionists are admitting that there's huge problems with the tree of life. But before we get to all of this, we need to do our interesting fact of the week. Doug, are you ready? Oh, this is the high point of my week every week, Fred. <laughs> I always okay. look forward to it. I'm ready. Okay, so since we're speaking of the Tree of Life, the Tree of Life is located in which country? The, tree? It's a, the, a Tree of Life. It's a tourist attraction. It's a fa really it's a can. somewhat famous tourist attraction if you're in that part of the world. The Tree of Life I, is located in, in which country? All right. Well, so I, I have absolutely no idea, but I'm going to assume that since the original Tree of Life is a biblical and godly concept, that whatever the most popular tourist attraction is right now must be something approaching the opposite of that. And so I'm going to assume it's in India. <laughs> Not okay. quite. It's in Bahrain. Where? The Kingdom of Bahrain. <laughs> ne never heard of Bahrain. Sorry, I know that was that was a not a real easy question to get. So I'll try to. Are throw they one Hindus? Uh, I don't think so, but hey, you know, <laughs> you know, you could buzz me on that when I'd say no, but I could be wrong. Um, so really, really quick, because I want to get to our guest. The Cedars of God are located in what country? Do you know that one? Think the of cedar. cedars and the Bible God. reference to cedars of oh. God. Well, yes, uh, those would be in Lebanon. Yeah! Yeah! Right. Good job, Doug. Okay, so back. <laughs> so. <laughs> So I want to get to the show here because we've got some really interesting cutting edge stuff on from genetics and really cellular biology. So Sal, can you introduce us to the topic of protein orchards and how this really is a super hard problem for evolutionists to deal with? Yeah, certainly. Uh, creationists, uh, I'm sorry to be a little bit critical. Some of the stuff that I'm hearing, uh, the way they defend creationism, the arguments are a little, are kind of obsolete at this point. Where we really begin to win the argument, and this is where I'm seeing a lot of people that were even agnostics becoming creationists, is because they're studying life at the molecular level and seeing the complexity of it. So as I was studying proteins and um, uh, proteins are coded by DNA so there's a relationship between the shape and the spelling of the protein. So the DNA codes for the proteins which are spelled in amino acids. Uh, you could use English alphabetical letters to represent the amino acids. And so I was just looking at this, and as I was looking at this, I said, that's really interesting. The way you spell something is the way it affects the shape of this part. Now, uh, we look at parts of a car and how very different they are. Um, you know, we have blueprints that make it. Now, the amazing thing is when you spell proteins, the, the way you spell it defines its shape, which is just amazing. If any of you have heard the, the so-called protein folding problem, it's like that's, the, that's been like a deep computational mystery. How is it that we can map one shape to a particular spelling? And so when I was studying this, I said, I don't think there is a universal common ancestor 
for all proteins. And I was in a recent debate with a secular Satanist, Aaron Ra. He finally conceded to me there's no common ancestor for all proteins slash genes. Wait a minute, wait a minute. The, the Satanist conceded something? Yeah, the Satanist was defeated. I mean, I don't think he realized uh, evolutionary theory has just been defeated. And he's agreeing with me. He actually thought he was disagreeing. I'm the one who put it on the table. I said, there's no common ancestor <laughs> for all major protein families. And then he wrote back, maybe he was in a drunken stupor, but he's not going to take it back now. <laughs> he, he said, there's no flipping common ancestor for all proteins. Uh, he used the more wow. he used the more uh, vulgar term, and we're kind of trying to be friendly, yeah. friendly here. Of course, of course. Do you think he realized what he said? Do, do you think he's how how long ago did this happen? And has he been chastised yet by the evolutionary biology community that I would assume would have come down on him like a ton of bricks? Uh, no, because he, he when I threw that on the table, he started consulting evolutionary biologists, and they said Sal's right. Of course, I was right. I mean, this is kind of my field, and I'll explain why oh. I'm right. Um, and so they agreed with me, and I said, and I, the reason I knew that, I've talked to evolutionary biologists, I said, is this right? And they said, yes, and I'm just like, oh, well, you don't see it in any peer-reviewed paper, which is really funny. All of them agree on this, and I'm like, are you kind of like embarrassed <laughs> by the truth here? <laughs> so Sal, you, you've got to help me, Sal, because I, I'm a layman. All right. Um, I thought that universal common descent was the heart of evolutionary biology. I thought that was that's right. Was so, a okay. Let me biology. let me give you a nice analogy here. And um, for the YouTube audience, I'm gonna we're gonna try to post some graphics to make this even easier. But for a radio audience, let's just consider the what we call the notion of homology. It, it just you know, it, it, it's kind of disappointing, but when you want to look, seem sophisticated, you have to coin new words, you know. And so the word, uh, instead of similarity, Richard Owen, who was an anti-Darwinist, by the way, a great paleontologist, as far as we know, he probably was very creationist leaning, did not like Darwin's ideas at all. He came up with the term, and historians of science, please correct me if I'm wrong here, but my understanding is he was the one who pioneered the idea of homology which is just basically similarity. So you could see that, you know, you can group objects together and say, okay, these kind of group together just because of their common design, common architecture. So you could see airplanes have a particular architecture, blenders have a particular architecture, pianos, and then cars. Now, unfortunately, uh, I mean, everyone started to say, well, Owen's right, there's lots of homology in biology. Uh, and so you have like the architecture of various kinds. And he saw this with Linnaeus. He was kind of grouping things. He, he said, uh, you know, God creates and Linnaeus classifies or something like that. Um, you, could, <laughs> you could group things together and we could say that's homology. So, so even before Owen coined the term, we were actually practicing the idea of homology where there's similarity of form. And so the evolutionists co-opted it and then distorted it, unfortunately, and they say, well, that means phylogeny. That's evidence of common descent because they're so similar. So let's just assume that all organisms descended from a universal common ancestor. The point about the parts, though, is um, they don't descend from a universal <laughs> ancestral part, and I'll illustrate that. So the thing is, for universal common ancestry to be true, you would need miracles along the way to manufacture all these new parts. Because if you're evolving a bacteria to a human being, you have to create new parts. Okay, so let's go back to the homology. So I heard the word miracle in there, so you need miracles. Oh, yeah. So you're saying that the evolutionists themselves need miracles for them to get uh, life as we see it now. Yes, and it's because really of the, By looking at the cellular structure. So when I was debating Aaron, Aaron Raw and his partner, uh, Chris Thompson, who's a professor of cellular neuroscience, and we started, to, the core of the debate really was over text after we had a live debate, which is kind of terrible as live debates go. But we had a more substantive debate on the text. And I said, can you tell me how all of these proteins, proteins are the major parts of the machines of life. The machines of life are built with proteins. Uh, I said, okay, can you tell me what the starting state was? 
and then we know the ending state, <laughs> and how did it evolve? They all said, I don't know. So I said, it's a, it's a matter of faith on your part that it evolved naturally. <laughs> you just don't want to admit it, <laughs> because you just said you don't know, and you're arguing it, you know, it's proven. I'm just like, well, you haven't, you haven't given a scientific proof. So we had here a servant of Satan having to concede that the Creator did it right, and he doesn't even know it. He got whacked over the head so bad, he didn't even realize he was defeated. That's kind of, you know, just like when a boxer was just, I don't know if you saw the Monty Python thing where the, where the knight was, you know, the black knight was kind of cut to pieces. It is but a scratch. A scratch? Your arm's off. No, it isn't. Well, what's that then? Yes, yeah, was, he ended up just that was yeah, I don't remember. think it's just a flesh off. wound. I just chopped off his limbs just... and he didn't have any spine to fight. It's really funny. I'm like, dude, look, um, I interact with uh, biochemists because they were on the team that published in this Oxford University press stuff. I said, this stuff was just floating over his head. He didn't even know what he's talking to, talking about. So, anyway, uh, so let's go back to the analogy of the car and say, okay. All cars share a common homology. Obviously, since they were manufactured, we'd say, well, it's not a result of common descent. But you had the point that you have homology there. So let's say the Owen-esque homology, not the Darwinist homology. Owen-esque homology works very well for machines, works very well for biology. So now let's look at all the cars throughout history, starting with the one by Carl Benz um, in in the late 19th century and compare it to like say dragsters, Formula One, hybrids and um, uh, EV vehicles, the parts are radically different. You had carburetors before, now you have fuel injectors, you have all sorts of modifications. But it's, it's even more difficult than that. The There's no homology between a car battery and a piston, okay? There's no homology among the parts. There's no homology among the parts. Because this is a radio audience, you don't have the privilege of seeing some of the graphics that we want to throw up. But you could actually see that the physical parts of life, the machines of life, so you have motor proteins, you have proteins that are like the homo hexameric helicase, that it's like a propeller that runs at 20,000 RPMs that is able to split the DNA so that it could be uh, do all sorts of things like replication. You have the topoi race that is shaped like a pair of scissors. Uh, you have a um, potassium ion channel that actually looks like a nut. You have a nut and bolt. It really looks, if you if saw pictures of this, it'd blow your mind. It's like, that looks, I'm like, that's God-made. And you compare that to man-made. They look very similar. And if you look at the topoisomerase <laughs> protein, which is, by the way, is a target of chemotherapies, uh, we try to disrupt its function because the way your DNA is untangled is it has, the topoisomerase has to cut it and then untangle it and then reconnect it. And um, I'm just like, look, guys, this is, you compare the analogy to the parts of the car. A tire has no homology to a fuel tank. It has no homology to a radiator. There's no homology, uh, Owen-esque homology, to all the parts of the machines of life, like proteins. And I'm like, do you not get it? And so when I ask, well, so, well, then you can't evolve these from a common ancestor. That's, uh, so where do they come from? It's like, duh, I don't know. So when I ask them that, where does it come from? They keep saying, well, it's no problem for evolution. But when you start to probe them hard, and because, you know, like our paper in uh, Oxford University Press specifically talked about the topoisomerase protein. So let me just describe how difficult this is and the problems. And we could go to like the collagen, the zinc finger protein, and, and this is, you know, this is where I'd say creationists stop arguing the fossil record. You're just going to kill your opposition if you can just get a little more sophisticated. There's a nice video, it's only two minutes or so long, available on the Discovery Institute. My co-author on the Oxford paper, Joe DeWeese, is an expert in topoisomerase. He's published in the top journal of the world in science on topoisomerases. Okay, so so you published in the Oxford Journal, right? A secular it's journal, a secular uh, journal. Uh, some of this work, right? And 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 yeah. because cancer therapies, uh, uh, they use chemotherapies, and we're trying to make them, we're trying to figure out ways to make the chemotherapy not so deadly because it it kills cancer cells, but it kills good cells. So there's intense research right. on the topoisomerase um, protein. So let me describe what a topoisomerase does. If you can disrupt it, you can kill the cell. It's dead. Okay, that's the first thing to know. 
I'm like, so this is not going to evolve in gradual steps <laughs> because if it's half work, you're dead. So let me explain why. There are like four steps that need to be there to make the top isomerase work. One, it has to detect the tangle in the DNA. Your, your DNA in the process of replication and gene expression or whatever, it gets tangled. If you've ever had tangles of wires <laughs> and trying to uncoil them and separate them, it's a mess. Now, topi isomerase... Yeah, as you start untangling it like this, you're in, and it just gets knotted up eventually, right? right? I mean, you, yeah. Right. I mean, I would encourage people to see the uh, videos on topo isomerase, particularly topo isomerase 2. So this is how it solves the problem. Um, be, you know, when we try to untangle things, it, it's nice to have a lot of room to be able to pull the cords and stuff. You don't have a lot of room inside the nucleus of the cell um, if it's a eukaryotic organism. So what it does is it cuts the DNA. So it has to detect the tangle, the knot. It has to cut the DNA. It has to do, then it makes it easier to untangle and it has to reconnect. If you, if you have a half-formed topo isomerase and all it does is cut, that's going to be really bad. It's going to spread the <laughs> genome, okay? So, it okay, if it doesn't detect the knots, it's a dead end. If it doesn't, you know, if it only cuts and doesn't reconnect, it's a dead end. If it can reconnect but it doesn't cut, it's a dead end. Uh, if, it, if, it, if it cuts and reconnects and detects but it doesn't untangle, it's a dead end. You need to have, it's kind of an all-in-one um, requirement. And Yeah, that irreducible sophistication. I, I, like, irreducible. I like the word all or nothing core, all or nothing core requirements. Uh, unfortunately, irreducible complexity has uh, be, it's gotten to be such an abused term. Um, I, I personally no, yours is better. Yours is better. It's fewer syllables, which is more relatable to more people who've been educated in the government schools. All in one core. All, all, all or nothing. All or, all or nothing. And maybe a quick analogy, Doug. You mentioned you're in a band. I've played in a band, and you've got all these music chords, you know, these quarter-inch chords. Oh, and yes. And they're a huge mess. I wish I could just cut those chords where they're tangled <laughs> and then we right? put them together. But we have to sit there and fight that whole battle that takes can take it's almost seems like hours. Okay, let me give you some. That's And yet right, there's this, right. uh, what's this protein called, Sal, that uh, does all this cutting? Race. Topo isomerase. Yeah. How, how do you spell that, T -O -P -O. Sal? Topo. <laughs> We'll put it up ISO. on the screen for the no for wait, the YouTube. It's, it, wait for those of uh, amateur amateur uh, chemists. Topo okay. isomerase. Yes. Topo ah. M E R A S E. Yeah. Topo isomerase. See, this is great. T O P O I S O M E R A S E. Topo isomerase. I get this it. A, oh, this is so awesome. This is where I'm this saying is this is the cutting edge. You know, creationists have been arguing a lot of the fossil record. I said, you're going to have really easy... Ar See, it didn't take but five, five, even less than five minutes to explain the problem. You pose this to evolutionists, the first thing they'll say, they'll say, that's an origin of life problem. <laughs> Someone else is... <laughs> that's kicking the can down the road. Okay. Wait a second. <laughs> well, wait, so they're going to push it back to origin of life, and next thing you know, they'll do something like... Push it to aliens. Aliens seeded the life here. Yeah, you know, they're always pushing say, these yeah. problems off somewhere All right, else. All right, so, but... Uh, <laughs> Pam Spermia. Also, okay, okay. But the, still, the, the point remains, uh, there's no universal common ancestral protein. You can't make a topo isomerase and turn it into a potassium ion channel. So that's another one. The potassium ion channel... Okay, so a nut has to fit in a bolt very precisely. The potassium ion channel has to have the shape down to sub angstrom, which means sub kind of less than the radius of a uh, like say sodium or potassium atom. I mean, can 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 you mill anything that precisely? And they don't use. I don't think we mill to the atomic level. Right. No. You said less than the less than an atom. That. That's that's extraordinarily precise. Right. And, and if it's not, it fails. You die. Without a potassium ion channel, you die. Okay, so that's another one. You can't, I mean, you have all of these things. So they'll say, well, you know, this is, again, it's an origin of life problem. It's not evolution. But I said, well, still the point is you can't evolve from a common ancestral protein. I'm still making the point, and Aaron Ra is still kind of, kind of in a drunken stupor here because he got whacked over the head so bad. So let's, let, let, let's, I'll say, okay, well, how about 
What distinguishes animals? Uh, Sal, Sal, wait a second. We can't move, we can't move off of uh, Aaron Ra uh, because I just need to remind the audience. So you got Aaron Ra to admit, or, or at least to state publicly, that there can be no common ancestor for protein. He got to admit it because evolutionists, evolutionary biologists quietly admit it too. Go ask them. Okay, this oh, is a quietly. testable hypothesis. <laughs> testable hypothesis. Any of you guys just start asking evolutionary biologists or evolutionary evangelists. Ask them that question. Is there a common ancestor for all proteins slash genes? I mean, technically it's genes, okay? If someone's really persnickety, they'll say it's genes. Okay, That's right. Just yeah. ask them. Yeah. And, and if they're really persnickety, it's from the same gene loci, okay, or locus. Okay, so I'm just trying to just clarify there. Ask them testable hypothesis well, if you start to see all of them say well I, one the first reaction is well i never thought really thought about it but that's probably right that's usually the reaction it's like let me think about it and i'll tell you why we have the benefit of showing uh you and fred here the pictures of the collagen spelling it's about uh say a thousand fifteen hundred amino acids long and the amino acids can be represented by alphabetic letters the collagen there's a section there, every third amino acid is a glycine, which is a G. If you colorize this, it's a striking pattern. Unmistakable. Yeah, obvious pattern. Okay, so we'll, we'll, yeah, we're showing that now in the video. So for those listening on the audience, you can, if you want to actually see visually this pattern or motif, right, Sal? Right. It's, it's there and it's, it's so undeniable. Yeah, okay. You, you go to another protein, like say the human zinc finger, and these are, by the way, you can't be appealing. These are I'm specifically like these ones because you can't go, you can't kick the can down the road to origin of life because these emerged, um, you know, when there were animals. So it's like, well, okay, these are some you can't kick down the road. You look at the zinc finger, you'll see the C, you'll see a pattern of C's and H's, very distinct. And if you see this, unmistakable. Now, these are exceptional cases where you, the human eye can just totally say these, these, no way that these have a common ancestor, or there's no homology, no ONS homology. And we take all the major classes of protein families, the computers that are really able to do this and compare. Uh, for, for you computer geeks out there, you probably use the diff function in Unix. You can compare two strings and say, okay, you know, uh, okay, so like, let's say you're comparing two text files that you just edited and you want to see the, the version, uh, you know, for those who do configuration management, you could see all the version revisions, right? They're, they're small. We have automated tools that could say these things are similar, these are not. Because when you can reduce the amino acids and represent them in English alphabetic letters, there are all sorts of tools that could say, well, these obviously form a family. They have ONS homology. And what happened, what I found out is like, good gravy. Uh, the way we identify uh, proteins is uh, they all kind of lump in this, uh, into families that are very distinct. And there's at some point, it's just like blatantly obvious. They don't, they don't share homology. Yeah. So it's like your analogy with going back to the car. You've got a, one set of proteins, let's call that the battery. That, and you have different kinds of batteries, but it, there's a signature in there, a motif. And then you've got a rotor or a transmission, and I'm not a car guy. And it's got its own set of uh, characteristic uh, attributes. Or the, and we, we're showing these patterns that you've got, that you've gone through and you've actually looked at the letters, the amino acids that form the proteins. And you can just see this pattern in these different parts of the car. They can't have a common ancestor. They have to be designed. They have to be, as you said earlier, they have to believe in miracles for all of these to start. It's an orchard of uh, design. And I, I just don't know how they get around that. So that's basically the presentation there, right there. I mean, it, you could, you could, if you want to go deeper, which I'm, I, I'd love, I love talking about the parts because they are so amazing. Um, but so just for those who are just, you know, far more sophisticated in 
I'll say, just look at all your tools. Go to the Uniprot website. Look at Blast Tools, the alignment algorithms, uh, Sparkle, position-specific scoring matrices, CDART. There are all these tools available publicly. You could see what I'm saying in a testable hypothesis. Uh, you students of science, why don't you, you know, if you're daring, why don't you start asking your professors? And they'll say, well, I never thought of that. And then, you know, just press them a little more and say, well, you know, just think about it. And, and half of them will, any of them that have bioinformatic backgrounds will, will absolutely agree with me. So um, uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, the servant of Satan, Aaron Ra, just like the demons had to acknowledge that Jesus is the son of God. There's some facts that are so obvious. You just have to just say, well, you're right. And, and you may not wow. like it, but I was right. And no one's going to argue with me. And this is, see, that's the thing about um, when you argue the fossil records, they'll say there's no transitionals, whatever. And then the evolution say there are. In the area of the protein orchard, there's not, you're not going to get any debate. They're going to agree with you. Yeah, this is a, like a knife right to the heart of evolution. Yeah. Well, and, uh, and so can I, can I yeah. ask Sal again from the perspective of a layman, does the, the impossibility of a universal common ancestor for proteins, does that defeat the idea of a universal common ancestor for creatures? No, not immediately. And that's a very good question. It defeats it in the sense that if you say that uh, universal common ancestor for all creatures doesn't require miracles, I just proved it needs miracles. I mean, if I go through all these proteins like collagen um, transformation from prokaryotes to eukaryotes, all the new proteins that you need, so many, all these parts have all, again, you get this all or nothing critical parts, all critical, all or nothing critical parts. It's just dead. Right, right. And they'll say, well, it, it emerged and, gradually. Just like uh, you're going to, you have a pro you, you, you forgot one thing. It's going to be dead. It's going to be dead without right. this. Uh, I, th I think, I think you need to revise your theory. Yes. Yeah, so that's the part that I was trying to get at was evolutionary biology posits the idea that a prokaryotic cell at some point became a, a eukaryotic cell. Now I, I hear what you're saying and it's like, okay, how is that? <laughs> that that's a pretty big... This would probably worth an, <laughs> be worth another show because this is, where, this is where I'm seeing a lot of people becoming creationists who were atheists and, uh, or agnostics. I'll tell you a story. Changed Laura Tan, professor. She was, appoint, she was appointed or encouraged by a Nobel Prize winner um, Smith. He, he won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine, I believe, or Chemistry. And he said, okay, uh, Change Tan is a physical organic chemist from communist China. She went to an Ivy League school, University of Pennsylvania, did her postdoc at Harvard, and then was she met this Nobel Prize winner and said, you ought to teach molecular biology. In molecular biology, you study the, um, the differences between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. And she said, no way this could evolve. She became a creationist. She became a creationist. Wow, that's because, cool. I mean, it's just natural. She said, these differences are so striking because you have all these parts. Just again, if you want to go from, say, a, uh, a car that is a hybrid versus a pure uh, engine, or, you know, you take any of these architectures, they, they may have homology at the, at, you know, kind of a larger scale, at the car scale. But when you get to the, the parts, you have like, for example, you also have different kinds of transmissions. You have carburetors versus fuel injectors. These transitions are not, <laughs> there's like there's like no gradual transition from a carburetor to fuel injector. You see the same problem, uh, not just with eukaryote to prokaryote in terms of the membrane bound organelles, but all the parts, all the parts, it's unbelievable. Um, so I'll, let me give you an example of some of the parts. When you have eukaryotes, uh, you have like the membrane bound nucleus. You have a gatekeeper that keeps stuff from going in and out. So you need all these things that enforce basically the passwords. The passwords are what we call nuclear localization signals. And when you start to take an inventory and the complexity of each machine that does this, so I mean, first it has to recognize the part, uh, and then it has to have an active propulsion, you know, a passive propulsion system to, to shepherd the part to the right place. It has to identify the address in the cell. <laughs> 
it has to have a, it has to have reading capability. It has to have navigation capability. You put all these, and I started to tally. I said, "Oh my goodness, these are so complex." The comeback by evolutionists, they'll just say, "Well, new genes arise all the time." I said, "Okay, let's grant that you get all these new genes. Do you have any of this level of complexity?" And they'll say, "Well, it gradually evolved." I say, "Well, uh, it's kind of hard to gradually evolve if the system's going to be dead <laughs> if you don't have all in one." <laughs> so, yeah. Do they ever appeal to convergent evolution? I mean, you know, they've got rescue oh devices goodness. they try to appeal to. Oh my goodness, yeah. <laughs> yes, and I'll give you a really <laughs> embarrassing one. And I, I, I credit a Princeton biophysicist. He's a member of the National Academy of Science. You can look him up, William Bialik, and I referenced him in our last show. Uh, he, gave, he gave the talk, the Hans Bethe Memorial Lecture. He said, life is more perfect than we imagine. He said, <laughs> basically, um, it kicks our rear ends as far as how good it's, you know, we could take the best scientists, we can't make some of the stuff that we see in the cell. Uh, so he said, uh, in one of his lectures, he said, consider the protein, the serine protease, serine protease. Um, and this is an example of what we might call convergent evolution. So I said, you have spelling that controls the shape. We have four levels of structure that describe proteins. You have the spelling, which we call primary structure. And then somewhere there, we have the actual physical overall shape, which we call the tertiary structure. You can have the same tertiary structure, which is basically the shape. If I showed you pictures of these, they'll look like, some of them will look like man-made devices. Like the tope isomerase which really looks like a pair of scissors and the potassium ion channel can look kind of like a nut. The last time I, I showed like the core memory, the computers looks like the, the the nucleosomes and the histones. God made memory looks a little bit like mm -hmm. man made memory. It's kind of cute. You have the convergence at the tertiary structure. There are two independent ways to spell something, and the, there's no homology at the at the spelling level. We call the primary structure. The closest analogy, and I'm sorry as analogies go, let's say you have um, the blueprints in the description written in one language and then the blueprint description written in another, but it converges to the same physical geometry shape. That's how bad this is. So you're not going to be able to, you have basically two independent origins converging on the same design. I mean, statistically, it's just impossible. I, you know, it's like uh, the, uh, the eye of the octopus is really similar to the humans, but, you know, evolutionists don't claim that we have a recent common ancestor with octopus. I mean, I don't go to the zoo or the museum and see a octopus with a man's face walking around, you know, like they have with Lucy. So they can't explain why we have really similar eyes. So they claim that the eye evolved down 40 separate paths, as complex as the eye is. So it's, uh, it's super desperation by evolutionists to try to solve these problems, which really aren't solvable. Yeah. Um, you know, I think Aaron Ra and a lot of these evolutionists that, that, you know, they're like Alice in Wonderland. They'll believe six impossible things before breakfast. Now, I, and that's what now they're believing. I do want to just show a little compassion because I just, I think I, I said, I used to be an evolutionist, then an old earth creationist, then a young earth creationist. And it was a long journey. Uh, the, the journey took probably 30, 30 years. Let me just throw this out there. And I have a picture here of a bent pencil, not a bent pencil, but a pencil put in water. And people will say, well, why would God make... Um, you know, make it appear that it evolved. Um, you know, is he being deceptive? I'll say, well, look at the bent pencil. Is God being deceptive because of Snell's law, which causes that optical illusion? Or uh, is God being deceptive because, you know, for a long time we thought the uh, solar, you know, the universe was geocentric and then we had the heliocentric model. I'm saying, look, uh, you're given data to help you figure this out. But superficially, superficially, before we had the molecular data, that we had now, I'd be like, well, you know, common descent looks powerful because of homology. Again, the evolutionists converted ONS homology to Darwin Darwinist homology, messed that up. But I said, it's still a compelling argument. And it was so compelling that this is an interesting story that Michael Denton, who wrote Evolution, Theory and Crisis, a lot of people don't know this. Uh, you'll find this in one of Bill Dembski's books, I think, Uncommon Descent, where he gets Michael Denton's kind of life story. Michael Denton was an old earth creationist in high school. He used to argue with his teachers. He went off to medical school and he said when he was in the dissection room, 
when he was working on primates. He said, physically, these primates look so similar. You know, the architecture is so similar. And you can actually see that a chimpanzee is more, has more resemblance to us than a tree has resemblance to us. So you get this feeling of like, you know, there seems to be a progression here. And so he said, I, my atheism, that's when I became an atheist through that process. But when he studied the problem more, he came halfway circle, half circle, not full circle, but half circle back. He became an agnostic and he wrote Evolution of Theory and Crisis. So how did I start to resolve this? And it was when I was at, studying at the NIH uh, at their FAS graduate school. When I saw how uh, they did medical research on mice, uh, it happened when I was studying neuro cellular neuroscience and I had to do a presentation and I said, how did they get these embryonic, you know, how did they get these cell lines? And they, 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 uh, they identified the cell line, my heart sunk because I looked it up. It was taken from an, an aborted fetus or a dead fetus. And I said, it broke my heart. It broke my heart. And I said, we don't have to use, we don't have to use human beings. And if you see all the medical research we do on rats, and mice, you actually never, almost never feel sorry for a rat. But if you see all the cruel things we do to them, I'm like, you know what? This, this reminds me of something. It's uh, the passages in the Bible, by his stripes we were healed. By his stripes we were healed. And in the Old Testament, that was pictured by animals being sacrificed on our behalf. And I'm like, you know, we are able to understand human biology because we have all these creatures that are similar to us, similar enough that they can teach us about our own biology, but dissimilar enough that we can say, well, maybe they didn't evolve. And definitely, if we have proof that the earth is young, then they didn't evolve. But God made this pattern of homology for our benefit. And I want to tell creationists, stop trying to say we're that different from chimpanzees. Yeah. Cherish it. Yeah, because, because thank there, God, there is a common yeah, design. Thank God we can sacrifice chimpanzees, which we don't anymore because they think it's in, inhumane, but we'll abort fetuses. But, uh, of course. <laughs> I'm sorry. And you know, you look at you look at animal life and the creation is beautiful. I mean, I'll, you know, I, some could argue like spiders and snakes, not sure, sure really where Jesus was going with those guys. But I mean, in all seriousness, they're beautiful. But Man's design doesn't quite do that. I mean, you you go back to the car analogy, and sorry for you javelin drivers out there, but I mean that that's like an evolutionary dead end right there. So, but God's <laughs> God's design is just remarkable. You know, the platypus—they didn't even believe that thing was real. Uh, a chimera, you know, they just they were like, well, what is this thing? It has all these different parts of different animals. God's got a sense of humor. And just remarkable designer. The more we dig into it, it's, it's a lot of fun, Sal. And I really like what you've done with, you know, analyzing these sequences. It's really cool to see the letters and then you just see distinct patterns that we were showing earlier. It's just so neat. Uh, super yeah. appreciate the cutting edge research that you're involved in. Uh, yeah. And I'm, I'm glad you're able to share this with our audience. Uh, yes, definitely. Sal, this uh, is I, I really appreciate you taking us under the hood because... Evolution has been is sold primarily to children. It's sold primarily to children by showing them pictures of hot rods and race cars and then discouraging them for the rest of their lives from ever looking under the hood. And, and you took us under the hood and you've exposed, uh, boy, just a, an Achilles heel, a fatal flaw. It's amazing. And we appreciate it. And by the way, um, Real Science Radio has another connection to Aaron Ra because about uh, 13, 14 years ago, Bob Enyart actually got Aaron Ra to admit that Isaac Newton was a creationist. Aaron Ra did not know that. He denied that on the air until Bob corrected him. And that exposed something about people like Aaron Ra. Aaron Ra is a victim of his own education. He was one of the children shown the pictures and told never to look under the hood. And he's, he's never looked under the hood. And, and you got him to look under the hood and, and, and our audience can look under the hood. And uh, what a blessing. And just, just uh, thank you very much for doing the show. I, I guess that's all I, I can say. I do say. have one brief thing to, to mention. It relates to our uh, paper in Oxford University Press. We were not the first to pioneer some of those ideas. But there's, there is a very interesting pattern. The spelling of the same protein across species is very interesting. People have used that to say, well, 
the nest it generates these nested hierarchies because you know our protein like say our topoisomerase is just a little is different than what you'd find in say plants like uh, Aridopsis thaliana and then you could look at frogs they have different topoisomerase spelling it's slightly different it still has homology it's slightly different and then you you put it through these bioinformatic systems and it'll be it'll generate these nice trees they'll say proof of the tree of life and that stumped me until I started working on structural bioinformatics but there's a solid industry on this where they're basically looking at creatures as having a piece of the puzzle to understand human biology we're using computational and what's amazing I asked one of the researchers in this I said okay so you're able to determine the, the shape, what we call the tertiary structure of the protein. Again, like I said, the shape is just like topoisomerase looking like a pair of scissors, and the potassium ion channel look like, like a nut, and then all sorts of other things that look, it'll haunt you how similar it is to human machines. Um, so that's a tertiary structure, the, the, the over, overall ge geometric shape. We're having a hard time trying to say, okay, if we just given the spelling, what would it be shaped like? Because it's very hard to etch. We don't have, you know, we have X-ray crystallography. Our electron microscopes are not quite strong enough to actually see the shape. We have to use painful methods. But we found out if we take, if we pump this through this algorithm, it generates the shape, and we were able to test it against things we actually do know. I'm like, this is really cool, and and some of the people are like. That couldn't evolve naturally. I'm just like, no, that had to be designed. Yeah. But the difference is. <laughs> It'll generate a nested hierarchy, but it's a consequence of God putting all these secondary designs in biology for our benefit. So I asked this researcher, I said, I want to do an experiment. Let's say we just remove all of the, um, the plants from our database. Uh, why don't we run an experiment and see if we're able to predict the fold? She said, uh, I can already tell you the experiment's been done. If you don't have plants, this will fall apart. That means all the pieces of the puzzle for human biology are spread out in all creatures, God's creatures. It's like it's pointing to us, pointing and say, I made this wow. for you. That's to help cool. you solve your medical problems. Oh. If you would just turn to me, oh, you'll understand. Because if you keep saying this is random, you're not going to discover this stuff. Uh, another way that biology has hampered medicine or i'm sorry uh, another way that uh, evolutionary biology has hampered the progress yep. of medicine and absolutely yeah with vestigial organs tonsils all appendix and so many other things that uh, you know the how the immune system can be used to fight cancer i mean that you know that's there's so many things in science and in medicine that if we that they would just get rid of their evolutionary baggage we could solve a lot more problems so, uh, guys, we're out of time. Boy, Sal, this was really enlightening. I, this is great stuff. Um, really appreciate you, as Doug said, looking under the hood. And we'll definitely have you on more shows uh, with more of your research. It's all cutting edge. And uh, you, without a doubt, you know, God's invisible attributes are clearly seen by the things that are made. And this is just another example of that. So, again, thank you very much, Sal, for coming on Real Science Radio. It's always a pleasure to have you. So, all right. So for my co-host, Doug McBurney and Sal Cordova, I'm Fred Williams of Real Science Radio. May God bless you.